Hello and welcome to our webinar on teaching Cambridge IGCSE Chemistry with Michael Strachan. I'm Tamsin Hart from Cambridge University Press and I'll be hosting this webinar for our speaker Michael. While we wait for more attendees to join us, let me share some details about the webinar. We're recording the webinar to share with you afterwards, so don't worry if your internet drops out during the webinar itself. If you're having trouble with sound, we suggest using headphones or checking that your speaker isn't muted in your system properties. Your microphones will be muted throughout the webinar. If you have any technical queries or you'd like to say hello and let us know where you're from, please use the chat box. We'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions for our speaker, Michael, please put these in the Q&A box and Michael will answer those at the end. To find the chat box in the Q&A box, please hover your mouse at the bottom of the screen or the top of the screen and they'll appear. If you lose connection at any point or you can't see the presentation, try leaving the webinar and rejoining. Don't worry if you miss anything, because remember, we'll be recording the session today and emailing that out to you in seven days time. So as <laughs> I said, in seven days, we'll send you an email thanking you for your attendance today with a link to the recording. I'm afraid we're unable to provide certificates, but you can use this email as evidence of your attendance at the webinar. Now onto the webinar and our speaker. Today you're attending a webinar on how to teach Cambridge IGCSE chemistry with Michael Strachan. Michael is author of the Cambridge IGCSE practical workbook. Our webinar will cover the following topics. How to teach to the syllabus, how our science resources can support your teaching, how to develop your students' essential science skills, how to adapt when you have to teach remotely. Michael is an experienced teacher, educational leader, and is currently deputy head academic of a senior school in Dubai. He continues to teach, specializing in Cambridge IGCSE, and writes a wide variety of materials, including textbooks. That's all from me. Thank you very much for joining this webinar. I'll join you again for the Q&A at the end. Now over to Michael. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, Samson, and a warm welcome to everyone. I'd like to start by thanking uh, Cambridge University Press for inviting me to speak again. This is the second time I've had the opportunity to deliver a webinar uh, around the topic of practical teaching of chemistry. Um, some of you may have been in the last talk, so what I've tried to do is incorporate some new elements um, of teaching uh, from my own experience. I think one of the things that's been true for all of us is that our pedagogy and our approach to teaching science has changed over the course of COVID. And I don't think that I'm teaching the same today as I was at the very beginning of the pandemic. So part of the discussion today will be around um, my journey and how I've come to develop new ways in which we can teach uh, remotely, uh, but also assess some of the work that students do as well. Now, I think Tamsin has given me a fantastic introduction there, and I don't think I can top that, but just to give you a bit of background, obviously I have a, a extensive experience teaching uh, science, but also I, I've worked as an examiner in the past, uh, and I'm a lecturer in education for the University of Middlesex and Birmingham. Uh, and last year I was elected as a fellow of the Charter College of Teachers. In terms of the aims of today's session, the first thing is really the exploration of how it's possible to support students um, developing their practical skills while working remotely. Um, there are some subjects like English and mathematics where they can develop those skills remotely quite easily. But with science being primarily a practical subject, we have a unique set of challenges when it comes to developing the skills the students need to be successful, not only in passing examination, but also in developing themselves as scientists. So I'll spend a bit of time exploring ways in which I've developed um, to overcome the issues of teaching remotely. And then I'll spend a little bit of time talking about how we can assess students. And this is something as we move towards the end of the academic year, that's becoming a bit more poignant. How are we going to make sure that students who are still working remotely from home have made the progress we would like them to have made? Um, this pandemic isn't going anywhere away anyway anytime soon. And so we need to make sure that our assessment of students, whether they're with us in school working face-to-face -face, or if they're working remotely, we need to make sure that this is um, examined carefully and assessment opportunities are given on a fair basis for both sets of students. So to start with, what I'm going to do is look at how students can collect data. And that's a key thing. We, we spoke last time when we did a webinar looking at planning, uh, and there are lots of opportunities where students can plan experiments, even if in reality they don't then conduct those experiments. But really to, to get students to engage with data, 
is a key challenge. And so what I'll speak about now is the ways in which students can collect data, even if they're not physically present in school. And I know that there are some uh, jurisdictions where there are students that are back in school face to face the whole time, some where there are entirely remote learning and some places where there's a bit of a mix in between. Here in Dubai right now, we are in a, in a blended learning scenario where students have the choice to either come into school or if they wish, they can stay at home and access remotely. And it's really beholden on us to make sure that those students who are at home are not disadvantaged by the, the fact they're unable to attend school. So to business, how do we get students to engage with data or collect data if they aren't physically able to come into school and take part in the experiments? Well, the five ways it, that we've examined at my school are home experiments, using pre-prepared data, virtual stimulations, teacher-created simulations, and then pairing students who are at home with students who are actually in school. And that works for, for the blended model. So what I'll do is just run through each of these different examples here and talk a bit about the pros and cons. What I'll say is every school and every country's context is different. I'm not going to say for a moment that any one of these is the best. What I'll do is just share some of the experiences that I've had um, and then um, it's a basis for discussion later on. Um, and, and these aren't the, the finished product. When I started at the beginning of lockdown, um, primarily I was using prepared data and that was, that was basically it. But since then, I've investigated and uh, evolved into using some of the other different uh, aspects of collecting data. Once students have collected data, then they can analyze the data. They can then do you know, write conclusions. Um, and, and that opens up a whole uh, new part of practical skills for the students, which without collecting data, it's just really not available to them. So completing practical work at home is possibly an option for some students. Uh, it depends on the level of practical. Um, Obviously, students aren't going to be doing titrations at home, but there, there is possible, so there are possible some students uh, that could access um, practical work in their kitchen, for example, or home bathroom. And if you go online and Google home experiments, you'll get a plethora of different pages offering uh, possible um, options and activities for children to take part in the home. The first thing I would say is a lot of these aren't really science experiments. They're things like making bath bombs and making soap, et cetera, which are fantastic activities but not particularly useful when it comes to developing skills for students in terms of their progress as scientists. Um, so why might you consider doing practical work at home? Well, it's a practical subject. And if students are doing practical work, even if it isn't high level practical work um, with variables, et cetera, it's still engaging them and it's still giving them access to doing practical work. And it gives the option for students to learn by doing things themselves and learning by discovery. So that is a positive option. And, and finally, awe and wonder, actually students being able to see things happen, um, doing simple experiments at home using, for example, red cabbage as an indicator, that's actually really interesting for them and it will lead to their increased engagement. This is something that we spoke about in my department at great length around, you know, could we set simple experiments for students at home? In the end, we decided not to go down this route. Uh, and the reason really centers around safety. We were concerned that if students were to take part in home experiments, there was a chance, however small, that these children could be put at risk. We weren't sure if every student was being supervised at home or the level of supervision. Some might have had older brothers or sisters, but not necessarily a parent around. And so we thought that actually, because there was a risk there, we would maybe steer away from doing home experiments um, as a way forward. Another really important aspect is equity of access. There may be some students who are able to get the ingredients, the equipment, all of the uh, chemicals, etc. cetera. Um, but there may be some students that aren't able to, and especially with the number of job losses and redundancies around COVID, we were very conscious of not putting students at a disadvantage. Um, and so because of equity of access, we again uh, were concerned around that. And the final point was parental support. And um, we had a very, very heated discussion in my department and the idea that potentially some parents could return for a hard day at work to find their kitchen spattered with, with mess uh, caused by a student doing a home experiment and when they remonstrated with their child and said, what's going on? The child was, oh, I'm just doing my homework. And so for those reasons, we steered away from that. That's not to say we should completely write off practical work, but if we are going to suggest that for the students, those cons there, safety, equity, and parental support would need to be carefully considered. The next aspect, and this is uh, one of the ways in which we, we began right at the start of, of the, the lockdown and COVID was using prepared data and so that's actually giving students the data or supplying them with the data 
and they would then go on to do the data handling, analysis, conclusions, etc. Um, I've used an example there from the Cambridge IGCSE uh, Practical Workbook Teacher Guide, and all of the practicals in the workbook have the data supplied. This means the students have to do the calculations because they've got the raw data there. And this was a very, very good way of engaging the students right from the very beginning of lockdown. Um, and it means that even if students are unable to go into school, they can still do all of the aspects of the calculation analysis from at home. Um, and even if you don't have access to the workbook, you can still prepare the data, do the, the experiment yourself, and then give the data to the students. Virtual simulations was another way in which we sought to engage the students. And this is something we used fairly heavily right at the start of, of lockdown. The website I'm using here, I'm, I'm showing the screenshot from, is called FET, and it's uh, produced by the University of Colorado. It's completely free, uh, and all of these different um, simulations are, uh, you're able to run them in the web browser, or you can download them as well. Um, not every single practical is covered, but there are enough on there for you to be able to um, set this as a practical. And what we did quite frequently was set up a practical as we would normally in terms of the students writing their aim and their method, etc. And then we would have a link on our worksheet to FET. So students would then go, they would conduct their experiment on FET, gather their data, record that in their table of results, then do their graph and, and go on to their conclusion and their evaluation. Um, this worked very, very well because students were able to manipulate um, aspects of the experiment. They could change variables. They would get some experience what it would be like to do the experiment. It's very, very visual, which was also positive. Um, but it wasn't quite the real thing. And actually looking at a, a thermometer on a screen, on a, on a, kind of a cartoon thermometer, um, is not quite the same as reading a real one. So although this is, was, was very positive for us, um, we felt that we were just lacking something there, lacking the realism for our students. And so we still use this, but not exclusively uh, anymore because it's not enough for all of our students. But that's not to say it, it isn't used occasionally. And I think it is a positive way of getting the students to engage. Now, the next um, aspect I'll speak to you about is, is something I've been working on more recently and members of my department have been working on recently is uh, teacher simulated data. This is where we actually do the experiment at school um, and then supply the student with the data or supply the student with a video or photographs of the data. We started incredibly simply and we were there just taking photographs with our mobile phones of thermometers, of uh, burettes, um, really, really basic stuff um, of weighing scales. And we would send the photographs uh, to the students on their worksheet and they would have to go through um, and, and read them off. And actually reading um, data from apparatus is a key skill that students need to have. And so, although it's very low tech to begin with, we were happy enough that the students were looking at these photographs and then having to um, gather the data from them. Um, but what I'll say is, I'll, and I'll share some videos in, in a moment, is they, they're not difficult to produce. So if you have a mobile phone with a camera, a smartphone, which most people do, you are able to capture data uh, virtually, whether it's a photograph or a short video, it's very, very easy to do. Um, I'll speak in a moment about the, the, the equipment that I use, but it's absolutely very, very simple, very, very basic. Another key principle is allow differentiation. So we had our FET simulations and some of them were a little bit fiddly. And so our more able students, it wasn't a problem they could work through, but actually some of our students who found these activities more challenging would actually really struggle using the virtual simulations to manipulate their variables and gather the data. And the simulations that we used, there was just the one simulation. So we couldn't really tailor it, we couldn't change it, we couldn't put anything more in there or make it any more accessible. Whereas making the data ourselves allowed us complete control. We could really differentiate. We could actually, and I'll show in a second, have more complicated data gathering and actually much more simple data gathering. And we could then change that as needed for different students of different ability. As I mentioned, the virtual simulations were great. They weren't very realistic. And actually, when our students are required to do practical work as they progress on to A-level or international baccalaureate and on to university, they'll be dealing with real labs and gathering real data. And so having the skill of you know, looking at a thermometer or looking at a uh, burette, actually reading from the bottom of the meniscus, all those things will be key skills they need to have. And they won't get those skills purely from using virtual simulation. And the last thing, um, I'm always conscious of how busy teachers are and how hard they work. And what we found in my department is once you've video or recorded or taken photographs of a practical, you can share those very easily. And so it doesn't mean we have to repeat work. So once someone's done a practical, once we share that, that data, those, those uh, pieces of media, 
all the teachers in the department can then use those with their class. So they were the key aspects we were looking at in terms of teacher simulated data. What I'll go on to now is I'll show you a very, very simple example. And this is uh, deliberately low tech. What I had was um, a, a very simple smartphone, a common garden smartphone, not particularly expensive. And I just clamped it using a clamp stand. This is being held by a boss and clamp onto a retort stand. And the camera is just facing um, the basic practical equipment in my lab at school. Um, this is very, very low tech on purpose, but this is a bit of endothermic and exothermic gases. It's a small snippet of a longer video, but I'll just play this now for you to uh, have a look at. I'm going to add 10 centimeter cubed of sodium hydrogen carbonate to polystyrene cup. I'm now going to add the lid and measure the temperature. Please look carefully Thermometer to record the temperature in your results table. We'll zoom in slightly so you're able to see the temperature. Make sure this is recorded in your results table. I'm now going to add four spatulas of citric acid. I'll place the lid back on and we'll record the reaction that takes place. Look carefully at the thermometer. You need to record the lowest temperature. So in, in the previous demonstration, you can hear that I was giving lots and lots of hints and tips and guidance there for the students. Again, that's a very, very basic demonstration, but by having the ability to add a voiceover to the uh, video, I was able to prompt students uh, and that video was used then with a, a lower ability class. It's very, very easy for me to then differentiate for a higher ability class by simply removing that voiceover and not including the instructions. So I'm able then to tailor the level of detail that I give and the level of support I give to the students by varying the amount of uh, advice and feedback and prompts that I include. Um, and that's a very classic experiment there in terms of endothermic and exothermic reactions. And it's very easy for students to gather that data, they record that in their results, and then they can then go on and do the analysis and conclusions, etc. But as a hope, you can see it's incredibly low tech, yet it's very effective. So a very simple smartphone on a clamp stand, and then you are able to, you know, record that data for the students then to, to read off. And they would have to look at the thermometer, they'd have to look at the different um, uh, gradients between the different um, points, and they'd have to record that data. So they're using those skills they would need to have in real life. What we're trying to do in a very simple way is, is get it as close to real life as possible. Because in the real experiment, they would have to be looking and trying to judge where the uh, thermometer was going to. Now, moving on to a slightly more complex uh, investigation, this is a titration. Um, there's still some prompts here, but as it's a more complex investigation, there are not quite as many prompts. Uh, I might fast forward this, this is a slightly longer clip, but this again is, is very, very low tech. I've got a tit titration set up. And then I have a clamp stand with um, uh, my, my mobile phone just clamped to it and it's just recording a video. So let's have a quick look at this one. You will need to record the value from the burette of hydrochloric acid inside. Record that value in your results table. This is the first or rough titration we're going to do. I'm just going to mute the video there while it's going on in the background. It's just me talking through the experiment, but hopefully what you can see is this is getting as close to the real thing as the students can get without them physically doing the experiment. So what's happening is um, I'm, I'm going to demonstrate the whole thing um, they all gather the data, it's all recorded, uh, and they'll actually see what it looks like in real life. It's all very well using a virtual simulation or just giving them the data.
but this is, is practical in their observational skills uh, and their practical skills as well, because as well as gathering the data, they're also seeing a demonstration of how the experiment actually works as well. So all of those aspects enable the students to really engage with the practical and, and demonstrate their skills. And what you'll see now is just me demonstrating a simple titration um, and then looking for the end point at the end of the reaction. We'll now begin adding the acid to the alcohol. So you can see I'm demonstrating all of the techniques the students would be using as best practice were they in, in the lab. And they get to see, obviously, all of the aspects of the experiment from the start to the end. And we won't watch the whole thing, but I think it's important just to start to see when the, when the um, end point begins to arise. As I start to see the solution losing color, I will slow down the rate at which I add the hydrochloric acid. Adding a small amount each time. As you can see, a total color change has occurred. I will now need to record my data from the burette. Record this value in your results table. Okay, and so you can see there, you know, there's a slightly more complicated um, investigation. With the final uh, one I'm going to show you here, this is reaction rate. What I've got is a number of different variables uh, and the voiceover the support has been completely removed. Uh, and what students have to do is, is monitor a number of different um, variables that are occurring and actually record a number of different pieces of data. So again, this we set up like a regular experiment on their worksheet that we're doing at home. And then we sent the video. And this is a very short clip that just shows that I'm not going to spoon feed them and give them all the information. I'm not going to guide them. They just have to look at the experiments that's taking place as, as, as if they were an observer watching someone do the experiment as if it was their partner at school, um, and record the data as appropriate. So there's the temperature, the acid is that. Now I'm not telling them to record that, it's just there. They have to record down the temperature from the thermometer. That's the temperature the acid is at. It's added then into the conical flask. And then we'd need then to record the volume of uh, gas given off. And you've got the timer there at the bottom uh, as well. So all of those aspects are recorded and the students will need then to manage those pieces of data um, as realistic as it could be. This would be something used for more able class who were comfortable looking at a number of bits of, of different data. Um, but as you can see, I've removed that support of the voiceover and this is then adding that stretch and challenge for more able students. And then finally, the last one, this is my personal favorite. One of the things I spoke about is that we have a blended system here right now where some students are in school, but there are others that are able to work remotely from home. And so where possible, when practical work is taking place for students inside my lessons, I try to pair them or buddy them up with students that are working remotely. Uh, and you'll see in a second from the video, um, the, the students in my school have their own device, whether it's a laptop or an iPad. And what they would do is they would then join in a Zoom call or a Teams call with the, their partner who's working remotely. And then they would then talk through the experiment and involve their partner as much as possible. What we say is, is they're not allowed to tell their partner any values. So if, if um, a student is measuring the temperature or something, they would then have to hold up the monitor to the screen and their partner takes that data down. They're not allowed to tell them, oh, the temperature is 25 degrees or the mass is 30. They have to use the camera and make the remote learner person working at home work for that data. Um, but it enables a dialogue as well with students asking uh, different questions and get a real aspect. So I'll show you a very brief, um, it's a very, very quick clip 
of uh, Samir Tens working uh, a few weeks ago. And so as you can see, students then are able to work um, in pairs. It, it's, it has some benefits in terms of um, the well-being of students. So students quite enjoy um, speaking to one another. They like the fact they're still involved in the classwork. They don't feel left out. They don't feel like they're missing anything. Um, and it's also working on those team working skills, the soft skills that students have to have alongside their, their um, academic skills. And that hopefully, hopefully goes some way to stop students that are away from the school missing out on, on practical work um, at all. Now, we've got students working in pairs there. There is no reason why, if you were very brave, you couldn't do an experiment live and live stream an experiment. I haven't done that yet because I have always had students in the room, but it's entirely possible to, if you had completely remote learners, but you were able to be in school to, to do a live session and do something similar here. But this is something very popular with the remote learners, but also quite popular with students in class. A side benefit is if there are students that are particularly good friends, they can still work together even if they're not in class together. So that's something we've been using more recently um, as we have students that are working uh, at home. Moving on then to the second part of today's uh, discussion, uh, and this is assessment. So this is not necessarily um, purely focused on, on practical skills, but it is linked to this, but it's also about making sure we're secure in our judgment of students and, and the progress they have made um, as I mentioned before, especially important in term three as we come towards the end of the year, making sure that our judgments, whether it's for reports or indeed for a, you know, examination, teacher test grades, as, as long as they're as accurate as we can get them, that's really important. The key three challenges that I have found is the first one is the fair access and making sure that a student who is taking a, a test, who is in the room, who is present, taking it with pen and paper, it has the same advantage and experience as, as a student who is taking the examination remotely. Uh, here in Dubai, we have to have a fair access, so any test that's delivered inside the school must be accessible to students who are at home. Uh, and so we need to make sure that there is fair access for students to all assessment opportunities. We must make sure that there's no one that's disadvantaged because they are at home, because they're shielding, etc. The second one, I think, is a really important one, is validity. Are we looking at a valid assessment? Is what we think we're measuring the thing we're actually measuring? Um, and, and making sure that the assessment we use remotely are robust and give us that rich data that we can then make judgments on. Um, and so making sure that our instruments, if you will, are valid is a, a key aspect of developing assessment. And the final one, and this is something that's come up time and time again from students, from parents, and also from other members of staff is academic honesty. Is there a chance that a student who is working remotely at home gains some advantage over his or her peers that are working in school that are being you know, vigilated by a member of staff? Um, and this is something that it can cause resentment, but also could potentially um, skew our data uh, and make our, our analysis um, unsound. So making sure that students who are working at home are academically honest as well is very, very important. Um, we ran some assessments at the beginning of term one last year, and we had some fantastic um, results from some students who had previously not performed particularly well, but once they were being assessed from home, suddenly their results became phenomenally good. And so it, it put a big question mark over those, those pieces of data. Uh, moving forward, we have to make sure that uh, we can be you know, assured that any assessments that students take are actually their own work and are a fair reflection of their ability. So one of the things we've done um, at my school is look at online tools to enable us to assess students. So um, we've looked at a number of virtual examination platforms the one we've used primarily is exam.net. Um, there are many different platforms that are available, but we've used exam.net because we thought the feature of it just, just worked for us. The key thing there was it has an anti-cheating feature, which means once a student opens the, the test on the platform, um, if they come outside of that browser window, the teacher is alerted and the student is then locked out of, of that test. Um, and the teacher has to give permission for the student to go back into it. Um, and that has discouraged any kind of a malpractice for students that are on the computer working virtually. Um, it, it's very simple to use. We are able to just to very uh, simply upload PDFs of our assessments straight into um, the browser. And the students can then access those and take those tests. Uh, we can share them amongst many members of staff. 
Um, we could just have a blank page and the students then write the, the question number in, or we can actually structure it with boxes for the results of the uh, questions that you were writing. Or students can even write on paper, and there's a function where they can take a photograph of their answers, and then the platform provides them with a QR code. They just take a picture of that QR code and they can upload their question paper to the platform. Um, and so we can mark it there. So it gives lots of flexibility. If students don't want to work uh, on the computer and they would rather hand write, then that's absolutely fine. And actually for chemistry, quite often that's very useful because it's difficult to find all the symbols, et cetera, on a keyboard. And so it gives that flexibility for us to assess in, in a number of different ways. And it's proved very popular, both with, with parents, but also with, with staff and, and students. Another platform that we've been using um, is MS Teams. And if you're using you've got the MS Teams, uh, sweet uh, class notebook is a superb tool um, that can be used and we have uh, put our some of our assessments onto class notebook the great thing is we can monitor the work uh, of students in real time and a few on a few occasions what we've done is set everyone the work on class notebook whether they're in the class or whether they're at home and and as a teacher you can go in and in real time and monitor the work the students are doing one thing we try to do is actually remote learners have to have their cameras on on a Zoom or a Teams chat for the call. And that means you actually you can see um, you know, what they're doing. Uh, occasionally, we can say to them, actually, can you just move your screen around so they can show me your desk and they can manipulate their, their device or their laptop to show you there's nothing on their desk, there's nothing on the walls. Uh, and that adds a bit of security there and so we know they're not, they're not cheating. Uh, they're not you know, gaining unfair advantage from being at home. Uh, and MS Teams is, is very, very simple to use as well. Again, it's a simple case of dropping, uh, dragging and dropping uh, PDFs or Word files. Uh, so it doesn't create much extra work for members of staff. We know that everyone's working super hard right now. So any ways in which we can develop um, tools which don't require extra work is, is, a, is a boon for us, really. And the last one, this is super old fashioned, but it, it's kind of asking students questions. And so we've used this in two ways. Um, we obviously couldn't sit and ask every single student who was learning remotely uh, a whole test paper. It's very, very tricky. Uh, but what we have done is where there are students who have produced a, a really good test result, whereas previously they weren't doing so well, out of fairness to them, we would bring them onto a Zoom chat um, uh, during a lesson and just ask them uh, a few questions around the topic that was being tested on and judged whether they were able to answer those. Because if they have been able to answer those questions during a written exam, they should also be able to get close to those answers in a verbal uh, exam, so a verbal question. So we've used that as, as a bit of quality assurance where students who maybe have done a bit better, um, and likewise where students maybe haven't done as well. Um, I had a student a few weeks ago who struggled a bit with, with uh, Wi-Fi connectivity and they hadn't been able to complete the test and had done a bit worse than they normally would. So I said, well, actually, let's, let's do some questions. And I just asked uh, three or four questions and that student reassured me their, their level of understanding was a bit higher and I was able to change their grade based on that. Um, I know that some subjects, not necessarily in chemistry, but other subjects in my school have done entire assessments verbally. Um, I would say it, it just takes a lot of time. If you want to sit there and talk through a whole exam paper of, of you know, five or six past paper questions, that's going to be fairly laborious time-wise. But if it was for a really important um, piece of work, if it was for a student's teacher assess grade, that might be a good way of doing it to really assure you of the um, reliability of the data that you're getting. Okay, um, that's everything from me. I'm going to hand back over to Tamsin. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Michael. So we've had some questions coming in. And I'm just going to start with those. Okay. So first question, please can you suggest more ways to handle inclusive education when demonstrating practical investigations? Wonderful. So in terms of the demonstration there, I think the, the first thing is um, the, the level of support that you have in terms of the, um, the, the words that you use, the vocabulary, and how much you kind of you support the students there. Um, it's not something that I've done myself, but the EAL department in, in my school have worked with the biology team, and they um, have actually made small little card cutouts with, with vocabulary. So what they actually do is, as they're doing the experiment, I said, oh, well, I'm going to add some hydrochloric acid into this beaker, we we'll actually have the label stuck on the beaker and it would actually have a thermometer label stuck on the thermometer. So that would be really helpful to develop student skills if they were maybe struggling a bit with um, the vocabulary um, in terms of being inclusive. 
what I say as well is, is the videos are, are, are a great leveler because it means that if students do have any special needs, then they're not missing that, that data point in a lesson. They can rewind that and look at that again. If they're distracted or they have some issue or they weren't clear, they can pause the screen. Where if they're in a classroom setting and doing that practical work in real time, and then maybe paired with someone who is a bit more able or in a group of four people, that data point's gone. And yes, maybe they can copy the results down from someone else in the class, but actually they're missing out on that opportunity to really engage with the practical work. And that's the whole point. So by having the videos there or even the photographs, that gives the students a, a bit more support if they needed that. Um, I think that's a really good way of being inclusive with, with our um, practical work. Fantastic. Now, another question. Um, students watching the experiments is good, but practicing them is better. How do we produce students that can practice the experiments themselves when they're not in the on-site class? Well, that's the million dollar question. I think it is very, very difficult to, to get students to practice. Where, where if they're not in the lab physically, we have to accept there'll be certain skills that they just cannot do. Um, so it, we can demonstrate to the, to the students. Um, and one of the things we can do, and I've not shown you at this particular time, is that we can actually do demonstrations from start to finish. And you can make mistakes on, you know, make series like on purpose mistakes, purpose mistakes, and then ask the student, then actually, if you, if you, what have I, there are five mistakes in this practical that I've done. What, what have I done wrong when I was you know, setting up this titration? So we can do things like that, but actually physically getting students to practice the, the key practical skills of things like titration, uh, et cetera, manually is, is incredibly difficult if they are not in a science lab. And I also say the danger of, I had a parent about three months ago, said, well, I'll just go to a, a science um, a shop, we're going to an outlet, and I'll buy a bureau, and I'll buy all the equipment, I'll buy the glassware. I said, well, that's that's fantastic. You have the ability to do that, and it's available, etc., and and the funds. But I, I'd be it's still going to be quite dangerous for the students to do that at home. So I come back to the safety aspect. I think there are certain skills in chemistry that students should not be doing unsupervised, and I, and I come back to that. So we have to accept, unfortunately, there'll be some practical tools. If they're at home, they just can't practice. Sadly. Mm -hmm. Now, here's another question. How do you find different online tools to help you teach remotely? Have your colleagues shared their ideas and experiences? Absolutely. So this has been a key thing. Um, and a lot of this, please don't think any of this is my original work. Everything I'm sharing here has been stolen from someone else. You know, everyone else had an idea. And one of the great things, definitely at my school during the first period of lockdown, was that everyone was out looking for new ways to, to uh, teach, deliver content. Uh, and so in terms of Finding new ways, yeah, absolutely, colleagues. I, I spend a lot of time speaking with teachers that I, I work alongside, both inside uh, my department, because um, scientists are the best, as we all know, but also um, in other departments as well. So the use of class notebook actually came from the mathematics and MFL department. They were doing some fantastic things, and we looked at how can we adapt that to science. So in terms of finding ideas, I think definitely Twitter is a great resource. There are lots of really good scientists on Twitter you can follow, um, and just general um, message boards. Um, for uh, like, like the TES, for example, all those kinds of places where scientists hang out are really good, good places to find um, educational resources. But I generally find speaking to colleagues is the best way because um, they'll always have something interesting to share. Yeah. Now, another um, remote learning question. Um, how do you effectively monitor practicals from home? OK, so in terms of monitoring the practical work, we don't set practical work for students to do at home. So there's not actually monitoring of those work. Uh, or that work, but actually in terms of the practical work that students do from the virtual simulation to the pre-prepared data, they would be expected to do a lab report. So, so just like an old fashioned, if they were in, in the lab, they'd get their data, they'd go home and they'd have to do their analysis and their conclusions. We would then take that in uh, via usually a class notebook, um, but some of them will email it in and we would just assess that as we would normally would give the marks um, uh, as we would in, in the old days pre-COVID. Um, we'd look at all the different aspects from the specification that students should know and evaluate them and assess them on those aspects. So although they're not doing the practical, they're still doing the, the write-up and, and the, uh, the lab work that would be um, otherwise. The, literally the only bit that's missing is them physically manipulating the apparatus. Everything else is expected of them and they still have to write a lab report and it will be assessed and, and sent back to them in the usual way. Lovely. Um, now a question about differentiation, but again relating to practical work, but this time in the laboratory. So how do you design differentiation for practical work in the laboratory with learners of different abilities or skill sets? Okay, so I'm assuming this is not remotely, this is in the classroom, you've got students with different abilities. Okay, so there are a number of ways. I think the first thing I would say is by your level of support and how much support you give that student. So if I know a student is particularly uh, strong uh, in, in, in chemistry and some very strong practical skills, I'll probably let them get on with the practical. Once we've done the safety aspects, and I know, you know which aspects they have to look at in terms of safety, I'll leave them alone and 
this might sound mean, but I'll let them struggle. I won't give them too much support. I'll let them struggle and try and work the way. And if they might come and ask for help, and I'll say, well, try and figure it out first. And I think by not having that support there, that makes them work. And it's actually, it's, it's good sometimes to have that bit of, bit of struggle. Um, if there are students that need extra support, I'll then be more present. So if they're working a group, I'll hang around that group a bit and ask a few pointed questions, maybe. Um, not give them the answers, but so actually, how are you going to do that? Well, if you do that, well, how's that going to go? And give them some questions there. The next level, I think, is in terms of resources. Um, and so there might be some groups that will be given um, a, a more detailed method, a uh, method with kind of, um, more, uh, so I think a level of explanation. Uh, the language might be a bit different. I might pre-supply them with things. If I know it's going to take a bit more time, I might give them uh, the, the pre-prepared results table. Um, whereas a, a more able group or able student, I'll make them do all that from scratch because I know they're able to. So they're the, the key areas there. And the third thing I look at is in terms of, of the grouping. So I probably wouldn't put all of my kind of weaker students in a, in a group together, my lower level students, I wouldn't put them in a group together. I might look at the groupings and say, actually this student is my strongest one. I might put one of those students who struggle a bit with that student um, in that group. So I'll look at my groupings uh, as well. Um, so they're the three main ways. And the, the final thing is, and it comes up time to time again in chemistry is language and making sure students really understand what they're doing and what they're saying. And so I'll spend a bit of time uh, focusing on vocabulary. Um, I might have some keywords up on the board. I might have some word cards out with the, um, the, um, the de definitions there for the students, what they, they're using. I've, in the past, quite often uh, with, with kind of young students, had little cards that have different pieces of apparatus with, with a picture. So they know which piece of apparatus it is which. Um, so they're general ways in which I would, I would seek to differentiate during practical work. Now, that's interesting because we've had a couple of questions we've received previously about skills, particularly in the classroom, to do with language skills and math skills and teachers struggling even with students who potentially were able math mathematicians outside of the classroom, but they're struggling with their language skills and their math skills when applying to them to science. Have you got any tips for those teachers? For sure, and this is this is not an uncommon thing. I think you know, as any international school where you have PAL students it's going to be an issue, but I think regularly you have some fantastic um, students when it comes to mathematics. They, they, they do struggle linguistically. Uh, vice versa, you have some students that are brilliant verbally and they'll convince you they know everything. But actually, when it comes to putting pen to paper, they might struggle. So it's something we're very conscious of in my school all of the time. Um, I think. Definitely focusing on vocabulary, making sure that, that there's an element of vocabulary in every single lesson. And sometimes for, for homework, making sure that that homework is there as well. I think being conscious that as, as teachers, we understand the lab, we're very happy in the lab. We know what a viewer is and what a conical flask is. And we can sometimes have expectations well above students' level ability. Uh, and so occasionally just spending a bit of time focusing on, you know, a good demonstration sometimes is worth much more than, than students doing a practical and taking your time to demonstrate. Uh, practical with the whole class there listening in and talking about the conical flask. Can you see the way I'm moving this conical flask around in a circle to help the color change occur? Can you see how I'm moving the few red and, and those aspects and actually really focusing on repeating and using the language um, and then asking students. My favorite question um, is once I've demonstrated the practical or suggested the practical, I'll pick the student who I think is least likely to understand and say, right, you know, Margaret, can you explain to me what you're about to do? And if Margaret, who is my kind of least, least able student, can say, you're going to go and collect this equipment and do that and explain it to me, then everyone should understand that. If Margaret says, well, I'm not so sure, I'll then pick a more able student and say, right, okay, well, Johnny, can you now tell me? And if Johnny struggles, right, Ahmed, I'll go to the more able student, can you now? And then they'll repeat that back. What that does is that gives Ahmed or Johnny a chance to actually tell me they really understand. And then Margaret gets to hear it from a different person explained in a slightly different way. So that's something I do. That repetition, although it's not, you know, it's particularly exciting, that repeating and going over things again and again is very, very useful to cement that in. Um, and then one final thing before we go to the next question, I, I found it's quite useful to try and engage with students in their in their native language. So if they are a second language learner, try and find out, you know, some of the, the keywords, what they would be in their, their native language. They've got a bit more understanding. And I think that can pay dividends as well. Fantastic. Very full answer there. And of course, I must mention that we are publishing um, math skills for chemistry and math and English language skills for chemistry workbooks that are coming out in 2022. So those will focus in on all those skill sets. Now, the next question, it's again about practicals at home. How do you guide students to minimise errors when they're carrying out practicals at home? Okay, well, as I said, we haven't actually asked any of our students to take care of or actually do practicals at home for those reasons that are out there. But I think if you were doing doing that, 
I think it would have to be a dialogue. I think the key thing was maybe look at it uh, before you do the practical. One of the things from the practical workbook teacher guide is that a very good question that was asked of all the authors uh, from CEP was, right, what common mistakes will students make? Think about those now. So when teachers are planning the practical work, they already have in their mind, well, actually, these are common errors that students will make. So I think if you are thinking of students doing practical work at home, I would, as a professional, think what could go wrong? Which, which errors could there be? And I would then caution the students and say, well, look, these are the common errors. You know, if you don't get the lid back onto the, the, um, the cup quick enough, you'll lose a lot of the, the heat from that particular exothermic reaction. So I would think beforehand, right, if, if, I was, if, if I was doing this experiment in the classroom, in the lab, what common errors would students make year in, year out? What are the things I always have to say to them? And if, if, uh, they would then supply that to the students and say, look, these are the common errors. Be aware of these things before you even begin. So I think that's probably a way of avoiding um, errors that students make in practical work at home. Fantastic. And here's a broader question. Um, how to make chemistry more interesting for students as they, when they find it dry and boring? Well, I, I always pity anyone that finds chemistry dry and boring. Uh, I think it's obviously something that's very gone very wrong there. But I think you can make anything interesting. It comes ultimately from the teacher. You have to be super passionate about every aspect, even if, and I'll be honest here, sometimes there are aspects that aren't as interesting. But you have to embody that and roll with that. Because if the, the kids see you and think, well, sir or miss, they're so excited about this, that will that will infuse them. And you have to kind of sometimes fake it a little bit. Yeah, we're going to do the transition metal. And, and you know, um, I think that's the key thing. The second part I would say is try and make it relevant. So try and find where this piece of chemistry, this specific part of chemistry will link to their lives. It might be very, very tenuous, um, but you know, is there any way you can link it back to football, current affairs, anything in the local, in the, in the local area, um, anything you can do that's gonna make what you're teaching relevant to them, as opposed to something that's in a textbook they might need for a test at some point in the future is a way that's going to engage them and get them more enthused about, about chemistry. But I think, yeah, being super excited about it and saying, look, you need to know this for your life because it's going to apply to this aspect and that aspect. And did you know that, you know, um, hydrogen peroxide is used to, you know, uh, do Miley Cyrus's hair? She, if you didn't have hydrogen peroxide, she would never have the color of hair. Anything like that that's going to engage the students and make it seem a bit more relevant than, than the page of the textbook, et cetera, is a good way to engage the students, even for those topics that might be slightly less exciting than the others. Great. Um, now, another question. I guess this is, this is about preparing students for assessment. Would it be enough to prepare or practice only by using the past papers? This is a, it's an interesting question. I, I, I don't think you could really, it depends on what you mean. So let me, I'll, I'll, I'll answer to a question. If we're just wanting students to pass a test, then probably if you drill enough past paper questions, then you probably could drum enough knowledge into you know the students for them to get a, a good grade in in a, an exam you probably could do that but what i'll do is just share a very very quick anecdote uh before i worked in dubai i worked in, in qatar and when i worked there i was given a year 10 class and we had an accelerated program where the year 10s uh, did the whole IGCSE in a single year rather than two years as we normally it's a single year it was accelerated class um and the idea would be that then in the following year in year 11 they would study AS level chemistry, that was the plan. And so I was given this class of 20 very, very able uh, young ladies uh, and we hammered it through the, the course, you know, hammered them the past papers, did very little practical work, uh, spent lots and lots of time focusing on the assessment. Uh, at the end of the year, they did the examinations, the results came back and out of the 20 students, two got A's. The rest got A stars. Now I should be really proud of that. I got a fantastic set of results there. The head teacher came and saw me, pat on the shoulder, well done, Mr. Strachan, that's a fantastic set of results. And I was really, really pleased with myself. When the results came through, I felt really proud. Not a single one of those girls chose to take chemistry for AS level. I had turned them off chemistry completely. So yes, they've got a piece of paper with a grade on it, that was fantastic. But had I created any chemists? No, that was it. They were sick and tired of science. So yeah, in a way that was a victory, that was really good, but longer term, what if one of those girls would have gone on to win the Nobel Prize or, or find a cure for cancer? I don't know. I've destroyed their future in science because I've just hammered them with past papers and content to get them through. So I think as, as professionals, as teachers, we have to look inside ourselves. What are we doing this for? Is it for a piece of paper with a grade or is it to actually engender a love of a subject and a passion for the subject, which is going to stay with those children for the rest of their lives? So that's the kind of best answer I give. Yes, you probably could just do past papers, but that's going to be a, a really boring way for the kids to learn. And it's not science, if you ask me. 
Right, now we have a question about um, pre-recorded videos. So, are there any pre-recorded videos that we teachers could use to demonstrate the practicals for every topic as per the syllabus? Well, I think, Tamsi, you can help me out because I think we have got some videos that we made a little while ago. So I think I'll hand it to you in a second. Um, I haven't found any good one. I'm not, not going to be mean, but I've not found an art oh, hubristic. I haven't found any good ones on YouTube. Quite often, they're very, very dry. They're done at university level and they don't really demonstrate in a way that's accessible to students. It's lots of very, very boring people in white coats. And so I've found, actually, I'd rather make my own because I can really engage with my students. The students like seeing their own lab. They like the fact that's their classroom. They like the fact that I've gone to the effort and uh, making those videos for them. So I've not so far found that it, there are some good demonstrations on YouTube. I'm not going to say there aren't. You'd have to just trawl through and find um, some on YouTube. There are demonstrations, but not very practical. And the key thing there is quite often it's a demonstration. There's not the ability to look and collect data. It's very much here's the practical, here's the result, and, and that's it. But there are some on YouTube, yes. Excellent. And of course, um, we have filmed in your laboratory with your students some IGCC practicals from the Cambridge IGCC practical workbook for chemistry. So your very able students are performing some great experiments and yourself, in fact, you're demonstrating. And we also have your colleague, a biology teacher, performing experiments as well. So we'll share those in the email that's going out in seven days. So you can actually see Michael in his lab with his students at Repton School. Now, let me see if we have another question. We have quite a few coming through. Thank you so much, everyone, for sending them in. Now, here's a question about um, levelling the playing field. Um, every student is not provided with the apparatus or chemicals at home. How can we replace lab equipment with home things? So, again, this is something we've not been able to do so far. Um, it, it is incredibly difficult. So, again, because of the, the safety aspect, we've not been able to replace that. What I did talk about very briefly in my previous webinar, I'm happy to just mention it here again, is there are some simple experiments you can do um, at home. Things like how many drops of water can you, can you fit on a coin? And you can change some variables, temperature of the water, size of the coin, base of the coin, material the coin is made of. Um, there's some very simple experiments if they've got a thermometer at home, a very simple you know, thermometer, they could do simple experiments around the uh, melting point of ice when you put varying amounts of salt. Um, but it's very, very difficult at IGCSE. If it was key stage three, year seven, you know, 11, 12 year olds, there are some fun experiments they could probably do at home. But actually, if we're looking at practical work that's going to prepare the students um, to be scientists and actually gather proper data, um, then I, I don't think you can really do that at home uh, with home equipment. I don't think it's possible to, to do a titration, et cetera, if you haven't actually got the proper equipment. And also, it might be dangerous to try to sub substitute some of that material for things that aren't, aren't practical. So I've, I've not found a way so far to level the playing field and enable students at home to do practical work anywhere near to the level that I would usually do with them in, in squads. Don't think it's really safe or possible. Now, let's see, but let's move on to assessment methods now. So can we share some of the more interesting and effective assessment methods that are available online, please? Sure, so um, I shared the uh, exam.net, which is something that I've used fairly extensively. Um, I think it's, uh, I didn't mention this before, very remiss of me. I think for the first year, you were able to get a free subscription. Uh, please don't hold me to that, but we got a free subscription for the first year. So I think if you contact them, you can gain a, a trial or, or I think it was a, a six, a 12 month free trial we got. So please contact them. So exam.net is, is a good way for, for accessing that. The second thing is, is obviously Microsoft Teams, which is a paid for package. So you need to um, have a, a subscription, a whole school subscription to Microsoft Teams. Um, I'm not aware of the pricing of that, unfortunately, but that is, is the other tool that I would say. And then for the, um, the Viva Voce, the kind of the, the uh, verbal testing, we just use Teams and Zoom. It was very, very low tech. We just say to the student, right, okay, on our lesson, on, and the students, come into our lessons via Zoom. Anyway, on, on, you know, on Tuesday's lesson, for the last 10 minutes, I'm going to speak to you directly. I'd set some clerk work for the rest of the class. And I'd say, right, okay, now, um, Layla, can we just talk about the last test? And I'll ask Layla some questions around that and just record the results out. So there was nothing too high tech around that. It was fairly basic. Um, but I do appreciate not all schools have access to things like um, MS Teams and exam.net. Um, I think even, even, lower tech than that, and it's not in my department, but some other departments have just sent out um, question papers by email to students and said you have an hour to complete it and you must return it by email in an hour's time. So students have actually printed out the paper, they've done the paper at home, scanned it back in and emailed it back as a PDF and the teacher then marked that. So there are some really low tech ways around that. I think the key thing is just to find something that works for you and not worry too much. There's always possibility that a student could then, you know, cheat, but I think students, bless them, 
they, they're very bad at cheating most of them and they won't go for a very small improvement. They won't go from you know, 65% to 69%. They'll go from 42% to 98%. And, and, and it's fairly clear when students are cheating for the majority of the time. But be very low tech, email them a paper and they print it out at home and scan it back and send it to you um, or email them the questions and they just answer via email. There, there are lots of simple ways to do that. Um, but the two packages that we've found that have worked really well for us have been uh, example.net and um, class notebook. Great, thank you. Um, now about another remote teaching challenge that this teacher is facing. How can I keep a track of written assignments, lab or theory? They find this is the most challenging thing in remote teaching. It is, it is very tricky, and what I say to you, you're not alone. I think that's a, a challenge faced by most teachers. Um, one of the things that we've kind of tried to ask for is, is treat it as regular school. And so when students send work in, what we would do is try and have a folder. So if it's a PDF or a Word document, we'd have a folder on our, on our workspace. We'd kind of put all that in the drive. So right now, if it pre-COVID, on my behind my desk in my lab, I would have a set of shelves, and I'd have year, year 10 tests, year 11 tests, year 12 you know lab reports in you know manila folders that will be there so we try to recreate that physical filing virtually and so we'll have a folder on our computer or laptop for each of the different classes and then in that we'll have a folder that says lab reports one that says test results and, and we kind of try and file it in, in into there and as the results come in what we do is have our tracking spreadsheet and our heads of subject have been fantastic at making sure that when a lab report comes in the teacher has marked that and that data is recorded on our tracking spreadsheet as if, if it was done you know, physically. If the, it's a piece of paper had been brought in and the teacher had marked it, all that data has to be recorded on our tracking spreadsheet. We just use Excel for that. There's nothing you know, super simple Excel file. The heads of the department will put on the different activities, whether it's a lab report or whether it's a, a test. And then we just in, input our data as it comes in. Um, but I, I think having an organization in terms of the, the folders on, on the laptop is a good way of doing that. It kind of replicates what we do physically pre-COVID. Brilliant. And um, we're going to move into the last 10 minutes of the Q&A session here. So if you've got any vital questions, please get those into the box. But we've got another question here. This is about online assessment. So do you give the grade just based on the online assessment or are there other aspects you'll include in the grade? Sure. So that, that links into the, the very good question, links into the, the, the Viva Voce comments. So uh, I had a student uh, in October did a, did a piece of where they're a remote learner. Um, and, and they were using undergraduate chemistry language in their answer. And previously they'd been averaging about a two. So that for me was a bit of a red flag. And I thought, hang on a second, I don't think this is actually Tarek's real work. Um, and so when I spoke to him the next lesson, I did a little kind of Zoom chat. And I said, can you explain to me what, you know, mass spec drug to me is? And he's like, well, I don't know. So, well, you've wrote it in your last test. So I don't know, if you wrote this last week, how do you know what, what that is? And um, so, and what's a dipole? It's, oh, uh, uh, so, so that was a really good way of validating that. I think the first thing is just look at the data. If a student has, has been get, averaging a particular grade or around the average grade, you know, four or five, four or five, and they're suddenly getting a seven, I, I would investigate a little bit further than and say, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the students some questions, uh, some pointed questions in my next lesson with them, just to sort of probe. And do you know what, maybe they're working really hard at home. Let's be fair to them, they could be putting the hours in and they've improved. And if they can ask those questions, then, then it would stand. Um, uh, it, it's it's one of those things where you have to have a little bit of faith in in the students. So I think it's looking at their their regular performance, um, and if there is a concern, I would speak to them and probe and see if there was there was any other out of fix there. I'll bring into that as well their their in class works. So we're not just assessing all the time. There are there are aspects of class work that students will do and how they behave during lessons. What level of questions they can answer during lessons, uh, and we should have a good feel. All of us should have a good feel for most of where our students are, and if a student is performing massively away from where they should be, below or above. We should, we should know that as, as members of staff. And if we have a concern, we should then start questioning a bit more and, and probing to make sure that's, that's um, addressed, I think, yeah. Now, here's a question that's really good to hear, actually. I have a number of students who are super curious about practical aspects of chemistry. What's the best way to deal with these students? Now, that, that's fantastic to hear as well, mm. uh, the best kind of students. What I would say is, um, for those students, we can then start kind of stretching a little bit more. And rather than just looking at the core practicals that they need to do for the ITCC, we can start looking at actually practicals outside of that. So I would find practicals that are not necessarily part of our talk syllabus. The temptation would be, oh, let's, let's start looking at AS practicals. Let's look at A2. I, I think avoid that because that, that presupposes lots of extra knowledge. I think look at some really interesting practicals. I also say, which is something maybe not a stuff now, is look at the historic practicals that happened and look at maybe recreating some of the, the, the practicals that were done many, many years ago and how the real practicals were done uh, in, in history and actually going back a, a very, very long time 
uh, into antiquity and actually broaden the student's understanding of science. So if they are really interested in practical, then let's get them looking at kind of how these experiments were done previously, how they were done originally. And there's lots of research opportunities there to get them involved in as well. And I'd say, you know, if kids are really keen on doing uh, practical work at home, you can do some of those fun, you know, making a bath bomb, making bars of soap, those sort of things where there's not any real danger involved. Um, they can start doing some of those practicals uh, at home as well. And you Google those and you'll find, you know, lots and lots of those. They can make themselves, you know, little simple lava lamps out of uh, plastic bottles with oil and, and food coloring, et cetera. So there are lots of aspects of that they, they can do. Those sorts of things, the kids are interested in practical. Yeah, or wonder, a bit of fun if they're a bit older. Absolutely. Uh, get them engaged in that. But I think, yeah, looking at some of the historical aspects of science as well are really fun there. Where our understanding really comes from. Great. And now a question about um, FET and related websites. Um, I think we've, we've handled this in a previous webinar and I think we can probably share the links. Aside from FET, are there other websites where teachers can get virtual labs of practical sessions? There, there definitely are. There are a number of, of different suppliers. There are some that are paid for uh, and some that are um, you need to um, do a free subscription. Um, I haven't used any apart from FET because I, I find FET does everything that I, I need it to. And I've not found anything better, but I know there are a lot of suppliers that, that um, do offer these. What I can do, I think it's on the slide from last time round. I, I, I believe there was a slide, but we can we can send that out on email with some links to some other ones that are both paid for and, and are free to access. But yeah, the FET is just the one that I found that works really well for me and, and my students. But there are other ones out there um, that are you know you can you subscribe to or you can mm -hmm. download, etc. There are a number of uh, different um, websites, definitely for sure. Now, I'd like to bring in a question um, we previously received. Um, this is about active learning. How do we use active learning effectively in the classroom, especially at the moment? Brilliant question. So that's one of the key concerns. That if students are staring at a screen and they're, they're very far away from us, it's incredibly easy for them to be distracted. They've got their mobile phone to hand somewhere and they might have a TV screen on somewhere else. So I think primarily for my planning, I, I want to grab their attention at the start of the lesson and make sure they're interested. Um, and I think the use of questioning. So the key thing is not letting any student go to sleep for a second. And by go to sleep, I mean go off the boil, then that they're not paying full attention. So I'll pepper questions around. And, and the first few minutes of any lesson, generally for me, is a recap of last lesson. So I'll be right, okay, you know, so Ahmed told me this, Mohammed, okay, uh, Jahara, and I'll just pepper questions around those, those um, online learners. I've also kind of developed a bit of a, a nice atmosphere in my classes in terms of the in class students and the ones that are remote. You know, it's an, an opportunity for them to say hello. So it's a bit corny, but at the start of each lesson, once my online learners are there on Zoom, I'll pick my laptop up, turn it around, we'll do a thing called a classway, and all the kids in the class will wave to me right there, they'll all say hi, um, and then we'll get into the lesson. And so it's making sure that you're engaging with them, asking lots and lots of questions and having lots of activities for them to do. I think, you know, and this is probably not a great example because I've just spent ages speaking at you, but not sit there and deliver a lesson by talking over a laptop for, for 45 minutes is probably a good piece of advice. Try and think of putting a video in, some questions on the video, maybe uh, uh, an activity with answering some questions, maybe a practical demo, but have lots of short activities rather than something that's a very long time. I think students that are remote will get bored quite quickly. It's not good for their eyes either, staring at the screen for a long period of time. So uh, really chunking your lesson into short, you know, 10 minute or eight minute activities, and then lots of changing over to keep their attention uh, distract, uh, with you. Otherwise they'll get distracted and they'll, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll be bored and they won't engage. So yeah, making sure you're constantly asking questions constantly changing the activities they're in, uh, you know, engaged um, and I think we've used really well with the uh, class notebook we can see in real time the work they're doing so as a student is answering a worksheet I can be sat you know, in my class on my iPad flipping through each student's work and seeing hang on a second you know Jenny you've not done um, question two you've skipped that can you go back and do that question and so being able to monitor the work they're doing in, in real time um, and then finally, I think it's uh, back to the teacher, back to you as, you know, enthusiasm. You want to make those students want to take part in your lesson and be engaged. And that really stems from your own enthusiasm for the topic. Uh, I know it's hard teaching remotely, and I'm sure we'd all rather be just teaching in our classroom. But if you allow the students to see that, they'll, they'll pick up on that. So I think being really large in the life and being really engaged and really excited, you know, putting that out there, um, that passion, will then make the students want to you know, take more part in your, in your lesson. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is not so glamorous, but just plan, in terms of plan your lesson, think about, you know, how would I enjoy this if I was watching this lesson through a screen? What would I do to kind of make this a bit more engaging? And uh, I think that's a good way of, of kind of keeping the students um, engaged and active in your lesson. Lovely. And then I'm going to move on to the, the last question in our um, Q&A box today. Um, 
it's all about teacher community and being able to share ideas. Is there a website or social media account where we can gather together and share our materials or share different views about a certain subject? Are there any that you know of, Michael? Well, I think Twitter for me is the best one. I think I go on Twitter. I'm one of these people who goes on Twitter and doesn't save them up for like steals lots and lots of ideas. So I think Twitter's really, really good. Um, there are other ones. I think Reddit has a fantastic teacher community on there. So that's a website where there's a very, very active uh, teacher community. Um, but I think for me, Twitter is the main place to go on and just subscribe to and just follow uh, some key. Um, it's a bit like a rabbit hole. Once you follow one or two people, then um, before you know it, there's, there's you're following 600 people. And, and that's a steady stream of good ideas. Um, and not just good ideas for teaching. It's also really good ideas for well-being and the chance to actually do a, you've got a question. You can ask a question to someone. So um, I'd, I'd say for me, it's definitely Twitter. It's probably the best place um, to, to kind of go on and find new ideas for teaching, but also a bit of support. Um, when it's when it's tough. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So it only remains for me to say thank you so much for a fantastic presentation today and everyone for sending in your questions. We've had a really good discussion after the session. Thank you so much, Michael. And thank you to Jen Byrne, our commissioning editor for science, who's helped us today, and Abigail Smith, who's been online helping answering your questions in the chat. Thank you both for your support. And remember, seven days after this webinar, we'll send you an email thanking you for your attendance today and containing a link to the recording and anything else we've mentioned during the chat. Um, to find out more about the resources we've discussed today, please either speak to your sales representative or visit cambridge.org forward slash education forward slash science to find out about everything we do. But we'll share all of the links for this in the email. But thank you so much, everyone, for attending today and participating so well. And thank you again, Michael. Goodbye to all.